Well, welcome to The Aging Boomers. I'm your host, Frank Sampson, and on the show we discuss so many of the issues facing boomers, their parents, and what we know is an aging population. And uh, I just want to thank everybody so much again. I try to uh, remember to thank everybody at the beginning of the show for all their support. You know, we're on a number of different sites now. Uh, obviously, we're on iTunes, iHeartRadio, a site called Boomian now. you got to check it out. Pretty cool site. And, uh, of course, our own site, agingboomers.com. Uh, you could download these uh, interviews and podcasts on our free app. So if you have an iPhone or Android phone, just go to apps, type in Aging Boomers, Download it, and you could get updated uh, on on all the interviews. So uh, I want to thank you all. We're getting a tremendous amount of support and great input. I want to also say that today's show, of course, is sponsored by Senior Care Authority, a professional senior placement and elder care management organization that has a national network of advisors to help in determining the right path for seniors and receiving proper care and even supervision. Uh, So whether it's in-home care, assisted living, residential or memory care, uh, and you need to get the necessary advice from an advisor in your area, uh, just call Senior Care Authority at 888-809-1231 or check out the website at www.seniorcareauthority.com. And I wanted to welcome our guest today. Um, I, I interviewed Vicki uh, when I was just doing the radio show, and now we, we've added the podcast, of course, and thrilled to have her back. Uh, Vicki Kind is a clinical bioethicist, medical educator, and hospice volunteer. Her award-winning book, The Caregiver's Path to Compassionate Decision-Making, Making Choice for Those Who Can't, guides families and professionals through the difficult process of making decisions for those who have lost capacity. Vicki is an honorary board member of the Well Spouse Association and has been a caregiver for many years for six members of her family. So Vicki, thank you so much for joining us on The Aging Boomers. Oh, thank you for having me. It's great to be back. Yeah. At first, I, you know, I have to ask you, six members of your family, that's not the hands-on experience you really want. <laughs> no, it's, um, I realize most of my adult life I've been a caregiver. I started when I was 21. My mom had a massive stroke, very disabled. Um, then I took care of my aunt with heart disease, another aunt with multiple sclerosis, my dad with vascular dementia, and then I had a nice little break. And then this past year, I've been taking care of my brother after a car accident. He had a traumatic brain injury Hmm. and had a lot of deficits, so luckily he's he's beginning to improve. And another aunt who took a fall and was hospitalized for a while and had to kind of rebuild. But the good thing recently, the last two people I've been taking care of, they're actually improving. Oh, that's great. Well, most of the people I was caring for, they just kept getting worse and worse. <laughs> and so it's kind of nice to see that, you know, sometimes people do bounce back. Sometimes people have that chance and, and that able ability to get better. Now, did all this happen with your family after you got into your profession? or? <laughs> um, I, I got into my profession as I was taking care of my dad and my aunt with MS. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the tools that I was learning in bioethics, I'm a, a clinical bioethicist, um, I was using with my dad, and I didn't even really do it on purpose. It was just kind of an unconscious tool that when in bioethics, um, which is like medical ethics, we allow people that have some cognitive problems to still have a voice in their decisions to the level they're able. So um, when my dad was mentally like a five-year-old, you know, with somebody who's mentally five, the, the, the caregiver has to step in and protect the person and make the decisions. But when he started to do better because we moved him to a better care community, um, he was more mentally 12. And so then I had to give him back some of his power. You know, right. he wasn't like a full-grown adult mentally, but, but he was mentally 12. So that me- meant he had some more power and control in his life. And some of that from bioethics really helped. Um, so I, that was about, I don't know, 14 years ago. So it's, 
it really has benefited me. I've I've really been very grateful that these tools not only have helped my dad, but have helped so many other people that I've taught them to. So, yeah, explain a little bit more about uh, what a bioethicist is. I mean, uh, and and fam, you know, people that are listening that don't have a family member. I'm sure most of them don't have a family member who's a bioethicist. So. And you know what are uh, what should some when would sh- someone utilize the services uh, of a bioethicist? So if you could right. kind of go into both. Yeah, there there are not a lot of us out there. Um, basically, a bioethicist is someone that in, protects patients' rights in hospitals. So if you might have a loved one in the hospital and the doctor doesn't want to honor the person's advanced health care directive or the family's at war and nobody's doing what the patient would want, or there is no family and we're trying to figure out what do we do for this person who hasn't left us any instructions. So there's all these complicated situations, and one way that I describe it is that if your gut is saying, this isn't right, this isn't how it's supposed to be, you may want to call the hospital's bioethics committee. Um, Every hospital in the United States has either an ethics committee or a bioethics committee, and you are allowed to use their services, and it's free. You just call the hospital operator and ask to speak to somebody from the ethics committee, and somebody will come up and speak with your family, talk to the doctors and the nurses, and and kind of help facilitate a better conversation. You know, in bioethics, we don't actually have the answers we have really great questions that will help people get to the right answer for them for them and their family. So that's something that's accessible for all of us, and, and that's whether you're a professional advocate caring as a professional working in the industry or a family member that's trying to protect your loved one. So if you're using the services of a bioethicist that's part of the hospital and you're maybe not pleased with the way things are being handled. Isn't that kind of a conflict of interest for, uh, for the, if they're rep, you know, if they're, are they employed by the hospital or? Yeah, they, it, it, yeah. it can be. So most ethics committees, especially at smaller hospitals are made up of a, a volunteer group and they tend to be really fine people that want to be on the bioethics committee. So there's usually a couple doctors, some nurses, a social worker, the chaplain. Um, They also have some community members, and that's where one of the protections lie because a lot of the people on the ethics committee are employees of the hospital, but we're supposed to also have community members to kind of keep an eye on things, to ask different questions, to make sure that we are, that they're saying, wait a second, that doesn't seem right, and they hold us accountable. Um, the hospitals actually have very little control or power over what the ethics committee does. Um, sometimes we have, you know, somebody from the hospital administration on the committee, but they're usually maybe just one person out of 20. So the ethics committee has some of its own power. Um, it never has a power to tell somebody that you must do something. We're advisors. We recommend, and if it's not going well, because sometimes we even can't, make people behave, um, then we take it to the next level. We take it to the legal department to, you know, we, 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 we call in the reserves. We call in the people that might have more power. Got it. So, you know, earlier you brought up, um, you know, health care directives. And uh, I know that, uh, as you know, I'm in the industry and uh, speak to people all the time. And the, the, the one thing that uh, I emphasize is is you need to really plan. You know, a lot of people don't plan for this well, but those that realize they should, they're hearing the terms healthcare directive. In California and many other states, they hear the term POLST form, P-O-L-S-T. Also, they hear durable power of attorney, power of attorney. Can you, can you help us kind of uh, can you explain those and the differences and the importance of each or which is more important? Uh, <laughs> yeah. can, can you help us Absol- with that? Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, and uh, Some of them sound like other ones. Um, right. And so I wish they all had better names. To be I agree, I, I, especially the power of attorney. That, that one yeah, is so, a, <laughs> um, so let's start with the power of attorney. There are 
in some states, they call it a medical power of attorney, a durable power of attorney, but it's usually power of attorney or some of the words in it. Now, in, I'm in California, but this, this standard is pr- fairly true across the nation because there may be listeners from other places. There are two kinds of power of attorneys. There is one for the person who's going to pay your bills and manage your finance. Finances. So that's a financial power of attorney. That's somebody that could take the paper that you signed over to the bank and say, I'm now the power of attorney and I'll write her checks because, you know, she's been in this terrible accident and she has lost the ability to take care of her finances. That's a separate person from the medical power of attorney. Now, somebody might choose the same person to be both of those things, but you may want to choose separate ones. The medical power of attorney is the person that gets to to decide what happens to your body. They're not, they can't pay your bills. They decide what happens when the doctor says, should we do the operation? Um, What what should we do with this person? Should we move them to the nursing home? The medical power of attorney has the right to care for your your medical decisions. Um, So, for example, when my brother was in this terrible car accident, um, my other brother, who's very good at finances, he became the um, financial power of attorney, and I was the medical because that's my expertise. And so we shared that role. Um, but you have to, it, you really need both of those because if you can't take care of yourself, you really need those, those signed. And be careful because a lot of times people have the financial one and they bring that to the hospital and the hospital says, that's nice, but it doesn't work here. So you right. need both. Okay, so we then we have two other forms. One is called the Advanced Directive or the Advanced Healthcare Directive. In other states, they call it a living will or other terminology. But basically, the Advanced Directive does two things, does uh, one main thing for us. And in California, our power of attorney for medical is included in it. So the Advanced Directive or living will says, this is what I would want you to know about my wishes if I can't speak for myself. Whether you are in a car accident or you get Alzheimer's or you have a stroke and your brain is not functioning well, this is a document that says these are the kinds of medical treatments I would want and these are the kinds of medical treatments I wouldn't want. And sometimes included is this is the person I would want to make the decision. So, um, most of the forms, you can just have uh, two people that you know sign. You don't have to take it to a notary. You don't have to go to a lawyer. Um, but you just have to make sure the people that are signing it aren't the people that are going to be in charge of you. you. They can't sign the own, their own documents. So, like, have your neighbors sign it or somebody else that's not really close right. to you. So that's, a, that's um, instead of a notary. You could get a notary, yeah. but you could just get two signatures or five. Right. I mean, yeah. save the $10. I yeah. mean, <laughs> if you want to use a notary, that's fine. But, you know, I, I um, had two people I know that work at a store that I go to all the time sign it. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, as long as it's just two people that know you, that's you, who you are, and they can sign it and date it and do everything appropriately, and then you give copies to everybody. It was all of these documents. You've got to give copies to people so they know who to contact if something goes wrong, right? Because if, if you don't tell me I'm your medical power of attorney, I'm your decision maker, you've never given me that paperwork, how will I know to show up at the hospital and that, that I have the power to take care of you? Because the doctors may be like, I don't know, are you the right person? Should I talk to somebody else in the family? I need to be able to say, no, she chose me. She chose me to take care of her because she knew I would tr- do my very, very best and I would honor her wishes. Mm-hmm. So the, the advanced directive for health care, they tend to be kind of simple forms like, do you want CPR? Do you want feeding tubes? Um, there's all, for me, that's never quite enough because there's nothing really personal about you and your preferences regarding other issues that might come up in the document. So one of the things that I encourage people to do, and I'll be glad to email somebody, uh, people, the template, or I can send it to you, Frank, and you can post it on your website. Um, I tell people to build what's called a quality of life statement. And it's a quality of life statement that talks about who you are, what's important to you. Um, For example, there's a question that says, what conditions would I find horrible to live with long term? 
or what would be a fate worse than death? Um, most people have that, that kind of sentence in them. They, they're, they're like, oh, I would hate it if I couldn't. Oh, I would hate to be in this condition. So if you write that down, that helps the doctors have an understanding about what kind of life or living would you hate? You wouldn't want to be that disabled. Or if you don't have something like that and you say, I'm very religious, all life is precious, then write that down so that the doctors know that you believe that any form of life is precious and should be sustained. Because I can't guess what's important to you when you're unable to speak for yourself. Um, Another question that I really like is what would be an acceptable level of better? Or I wouldn't like it, but I would be willing to live with. Um, So a lot of people are like, I'd be willing to live, you know, with a little dementia, but not a lot. Or I'd be willing to live on, I wouldn't be able to live on a ventilator. I would hate being strapped down in a bed. Or, you know, everyone has different opinions, but if I don't know them, I can't advocate for them. So this template really helps, gives you a chance to explain a little bit more about your preferences. What's important to you when you die? What kind of religious values should we be aware of? Um, what, what do you want to tell your decision maker so they're reassured that they're doing the right thing? All sorts of things like that. That's, that's very important. And um, we'll, we'll, before we um, end the show today, we'll get your information. So if somebody wanted to contact you for these forms as well as other information, I'll, we'll have them do that. Uh, the, can you get into the Pulsed form a little yeah, bit? The, the uh, yeah, the Pulsed. Um, I love the Pulsed. It's a physician orders for life-sustaining treatments. And basically what it does is it takes the, your wishes, what you might have written down on your advanced directive or communicated to your doctor, and it puts it into a form that the physician signs and you sign or your decision-maker signs. Um, basically, the two of you agree that this is the right plan. This is what I would really want in these situations. And because the doctor signs it, it becomes what's called a physician order. So that means it'll be honored, more so than the advanced directive. Um, So here's an example why we have POLST. Um, If you're at home and your loved one is there and they see you collapse on the floor, they call 911 and they have a copy of your advanced directive Uh, The EMTs, the ambulance people, they arrive, and by the time they arrive, you're dead, right? And so they start CPR. They start taking, doing your heart and and putting air into you, and your family members holding the advanced director saying, no, he doesn't want CPR. Look, it's written right here. But it won't work because it's not a physician's order, and the EMTs can only do what doctors tell them to do. Mm-hmm. That The post is different because, because the doctor has signed it, and like in California, it's bright pink. We keep a copy on the front of our refrigerator. The EMTs can go to the refrigerator and look at the post form and say, ah, I know exactly what this person wants, and they can honor it. Now, the post is not for everybody. Um, because the decisions are very limited on the form, um, it's a, a form that you should use when you're terminally ill, maybe have a year to live, um, or are ready to make these serious decisions. You know for certain what you would want, because um, there's not a lot of flexibility in the form. There's it's this or that, maybe three options in different categories. Um, so I don't. I have an advanced directive. But I don't have a post because I'm not um, terminally ill or chronically ill in a way that it would be time for me to have this special form. Um, so eventually I'll have one when, it, when I'm sick enough. Um, so, I mean, would you say post- that every, every adult should have an advanced health care directive? Yes. Yeah, every because- adult over 18 who has enough mental ability to understand and fill out the form? Yes. Yeah, if because you, you never know what tomorrow you never know what tomorrow would bring. Unfortunately, look what happened yeah. with your brother with uh, the accident. Yeah. I mean, you just never yeah, know what 56. tomorrow will bring. 
Yeah. Right. He, right. He's 56, and somebody was texting and smashed right into him. Didn't even yeah. slow down. It was ended up being a four-car collision. Okay. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, right. In medical ethics and health law, most of the cases where terrible things have happened that have gone through the court system happen to people in their 20s. You know, where all of a sudden they're on a ventilator. They're they're seriously impaired and people are fighting over what's the right thing to do. You know, that's the other reason you want to fill out an advance directive and make sure you have the power of attorney for health care included is you don't want your family to be fighting. Um, For people who live in California, there is no automatic decision maker. It's not automatically your spouse or partner or significant other. It can be anybody. So think about the person you like the least in your family, that person that annoys you. If they're loud enough and they're bossy enough, they might be able to convince the doctors that they should be in charge of you. Right. And the last thing you want to do is you you don't want to have the courts making that decision. So that's why you want to have that They don't know anything about health. That's right. Uh, My experience has been those are not good decisions. Right. So... uh, Speaking, you know, I mean, we're talking about having discussions with uh, with parents, et cetera. Um, so let's say, you know, an adult child wants to have uh, some conversation with the parents regarding end-of-life decisions. The parents are kind of old school and say something like, hey, son, don't worry. You know, funeral plans are all taken care of. You have nothing to worry about. Okay, or you have a reverse situation where the parent wants to have this discussion with their children and they say, uh, you know, and the response is from the child, the adult child, stop it, Dad, you're not going anywhere. Right. So how do you deal with these situations? It's a really common problem um, because what, what I tell people to do is to be the role model in the conversation. Instead of walking in with these forms and saying, you know, Mom and Dad, you're really old. Fill out these dying forms. That's not going to work, right? Because it, it feels like just it's for the old people. Um, so what I tell people to do is to fill out their own form. You know, if I'm the adult child, fill out your own form. Struggle with these questions. Think about what's important to you. And then say, Mom and Dad, and maybe have more relatives come over. Say, I want to tell you about my decisions, because that's part of the process. You don't just fill out the forms. You have the conversation. And you walk into the house, and you sit down, and you say, here's what I would want. This is what I'm thinking. This is why, why I'm choosing this person. And when you do that, all of a sudden, people are going to start saying, well, that's not what I would choose. Or I didn't know you felt that way. And all of a sudden, the conversation becomes a family conversation. So what I, what I actually do is I, I do um, like advanced directive parties, like Tupperware parties, <laughs> where That's I'll fun. go and meet with a whole family. That's I give everybody the forms, and we slowly work it through together, right? Because it is for everyone who's an adult in the family. And I love it because people start talking. They'll say, oh, I never knew that you would want that. Oh, and, and the great thing is if something happens and the family is sitting in the hospital, they'll say, remember at the meeting she told us, right? And the, everyone will feel more confident about their decisions. Um, another great tool that can help facilitate these conversations are the Go Wish cards. It's a little card game and conversation tool where people sort what they want or what they don't want and what's kind of in between for them into piles and then you write down the answers. Um, You can also play it online for free. It's GoWish.com. That's a great tool that I would recommend. Um, If for the elders in the family, I tell them, don't forget, this is a gift you give to your children. You do not want them traumatized in the emergency room or the ICU, and the doctors are like, well, what does she want? What does she want? And you're like, I don't know. I never talked to her. I wouldn't talk to her. I mean, You are leaving not just grief for your family because you're dying. You're leaving pain and guilt and regret because people didn't know the right thing to say. You know, for me, I think Thanksgiving is a perfect holiday to have these conversations because it's it's a thanks, being grateful, being with family. 
you know, it's a time and an opportunity to say, this is what's important to me. This is what I need you to know about my life and my choices. So that's, that's how I would start that conversation. That's a great suggestion. Great suggestion. So, boy, time f- flew by here. Um, I, you know, for those that are, you know, in California that uh, may want to use your services, certainly would like you to share uh, your information. But even those that are uh, not in the area, uh, or even for those that are, you've developed, uh, you not only have your book, The Caregiver's Path to Compassionate Decision Making, but you also developed some DVDs called End of Life Conversation Kit, and you have a resource workbook. You've developed so many things. So why don't you tell everybody not only how they could contact you, but how to get access to this information as well. Yeah, thank you. Well, my website is kindethics.com, and that's my last name, kind, and then ethics, E-T-H-I-C-S dot com. And you can email me at kindethics at gmail.com, and I can send you additional information. Um, I also do phone consults because there are people all Uh across the country that will call me and want to run something by me. Can I talk to you about the situation I'm in? You know, so I can facilitate that for people. And um, and there's a lot of great resources on my website. I would encourage people. Oh, tremendous And then amount, they can just yeah. order the, the uh, resources directly from me. And my book is on Amazon and Kindle and all the places you buy books. Great. Vicki, it was just, as always, great having you on the show. we got to have you on again sooner. There's always such... Uh, important information to discuss and I just commend you with the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you for having me on and thanks for all you're doing to get the word out. Oh, you're very welcome. And I want to I want to thank everybody out there for for joining us as as always and uh if you share with uh, friends and family uh our website or send them over to iTunes or iHeartRadio or download our app You'll get uh, just updated with uh, some great information from some wonderful people, uh, not only in the healthcare industry, but also, you know, dealing with uh, issues facing boomers um, today and in the future. So, again, thanks so much for joining us. Be safe out there, and we'll talk to you all soon.